If you want to turn to Matthew 16, and whilst you are turning to that, there is a very important thank you that I want to make today. Um, Trevor and Lynn Watkins, are you here? Do you want to wave at me from somewhere? Can I embarrass you just by standing up for one minute? Is that all right? Trevor here uh, has been doing our accounts as treasurer for a number of years, and I've got to say he has been brilliant. Uh, He's kept us accountable, he's kept us informed, and he has kept us on the right path at all times, and he has been outstanding. He couldn't have done that without this beautiful young lady beside him called Lynn. And uh, I just want to say a massive thank you for you as you step down right now. Is that okay? So let's give him a round of applause. Thank you. It's always important to thank those people that serve in such great measure. I mean, thank all of us for all we do, but uh, that's been an incredible service, and we just appreciate you so much. For those of you who don't know, know Sandra Lazarus has taken over from Trevor, and uh, you'll get to see her a lot more in the members' meeting. She had her first outing this week, and uh, she just looked beautiful, so it was good. How's that? So we're, we're at uh, Mark 16. And we'll be going from verse 9. I will crack straight on. Am I lying to you? Yeah, I just want to check that you're paying attention. So it's Mark 16. And we're going to go from verse 9. I'll give you another minute to find it. (laughs) Matthew's my favorite gospel, by the way. It just rolls off the tongue. It's on screen if you don't have a Bible. If you don't have one and you want one, uh, go to Amazon. If you struggle with that, come and see me. (laughs) When Jesus rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had driven seven demons. She went and told those who had been with him and who were mourning and weeping when they heard that Jesus was alive and that she had seen him They did not believe it. Afterwards, Jesus appeared in a different form to two of them while they were walking in the country. These returned and reported it to the rest, but they did not believe them either. Later, Jesus appeared to the eleven. As they were eating, he rebuked them for their lack of faith and their stubborn refusal to believe those who had seen him after he had risen. He said to them, go into all the world and preach the good news to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe, believe will be condemned. And these signs would accompany those who believe in my name. They will drive out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up snakes with their hands. And when they drink deadly poison, It will not hurt them at all. They will place their hands on sick people and they will get well. After the Lord Jesus had spoken to them, he was taken up into heaven and he sat at the right hand of God. Then the disciples went out and preached everywhere and the Lord worked with them and confirmed his word by the signs that accompanied it. Lord, speak for your word. In Jesus' name, amen. A, a number of years ago, Sound Desk Lotsey here got me into this, uh, this Marvel, um, Marvel superhero thing. You know, all these different superhero films that seem to come out every week. And, uh, and he particularly said, you need to watch four. And I watched four, and I thought, couldn't they have been a little bit more creative? A man, bit butch, swinging a hammer. You know, I think you might as well have given the man a white van as well and said, off you go, mate. You know. Could you not have had more imagination, I thought? This is, this is just boring. And then I watched the second one and everything changed because the man's now got lightning coming out of his eyes and his ears and his hands and he's still killing people with striking lightning because apparently he's like God of thunder or something. And, uh, and then he's like out there with a hammer now and his hammer's going 10 times faster and kicking, you know, I won't say the word, uh, out of people, uh, lots of people. <laughs> and, uh, and then... And then a little bit of a spoiler here, if anyone hasn't seen the recent Endgame film. Oh, don't spoil So Thor turns up now with a beer belly, and he's just like a wimp. He's just like a wimp. Spoiler alert right there. And, uh, but 
Here's my concern for the church. Full of power. In fact, when Jesus was walking with them, they had sort of a half power. He breathed on them. They went out and they, they were powerful. Uh, and then at Pentecost, full power. And they go out into the world and they start changing the world, even at the cost of their lives. You know, kill me and loads of others will come out and start spreading the word again. Power, power, power. People change. People set free. People healed. People raised from the dead. And then you get to today's church. And it's like the beer bellies arrived. And it's like limp biscuit. It's like, where is the power Maybe in parts, it's like a, a car that's one of its cylinders isn't quite firing right. It's like it's firing in places, but not in all. And you ask yourselves, what happened to the church? Because Jesus says something really clear. He says, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. That's a really bold statement. Go and preach to everyone across the world because I'm on my throne, I'm coming back soon. And when I get back, I want to know what's been going on, although he knows by his Holy Spirit. He says, go and preach to the whole world. You know, there are people out there that are trying, they've written books on it and there's lecturers all over the world lecturing on whether preaching is dead. But Jesus' main method for sharing the gospel was this, preach to the world. It's only dead if you can't do it. It's only dead if you, if you think that you want to do it, but actually you see people doing it and you don't understand that the preachers are called and anointed by God to preach the word. And when you can't do it, there's no point trying to change it into some other thing. Jesus' main method of, preaching, or of reaching the people in the world is preaching the gospel. Preaching the gospel, that's his number one method to do it. And when we preach the gospel, when we evangelize the gospel, it comes with the power of God. Are you with me? That's what Jesus does. But he goes on and he says something very different. He says, not only will you preach to the world, these are the signs that will accompany you. You will go out and preach the gospel and you will go out and you will pick up snakes and you won't be harmed. You will drink deadly poison and it won't kill you. It won't harm you. You will lay hands on people and they will be healed. You will raise the dead. These are really bold things, aren't they? He says, you will do these things. You will do these things. Ask yourself, how is that going? How is that going for the church today? How are we doing as we walk out into the world and as we look around at the things that are happening? Are they the things that we see? You see, what Jesus doesn't say is go, find yourself a cozy church in the countryside somewhere or even in the city and make sure that you critique it to high heaven. Don't go and find yourself a church and drive out the pastors. Go and find yourself a church and critique everything. Go and drink deadly coffee. He says, no. <laughs> drink deadly poison. Not that he says go and do it. You know there are people out there that have been preaching and brought in a snake and said, I'm going to get bitten by the snake and I will live because of this scripture. And guess what happened? You idiot. You know, <laughs> what, a, what a stupid thing to do. And they die. It's like, well, I didn't know that was going to happen. Well, you know, what he's saying is not that you would just go out and pick up snakes for a laugh. It's like if you get into trouble, Jesus will save you. But if you just deliberately go and put yourself in trouble, then you're stupid. But does this passage not challenge you? That when you look at the church and you look at what we do, 99, and then this is a, you know, fictitious figures, but they're probably right, 99% of our effort is about trying to get out of bed to come to church on time on a Sunday and enjoy all the things that church are given us and then moan when they don't. But like 99% of what I read in that passage is get out of the church and go into the world and change people's lives. But we don't have time for that. Because the chairs might be out of place, and who's going to make sure they're in the right place? And I may not get a car parking space, and a coffee might taste like junk. What is it about church today? We need to ask ourselves, do we understand what Jesus was saying in this passage? He was saying, I'm equipping you as my army to go out into the world and make a difference. You shouldn't have time to be that concerned about the shape of anything else here. Because you should be so busy about the work that Jesus has called you to do. As Robbie Dawkins said, he says that Jesus did not come to show us what he can do. He came to show us what we will do. 
He came to equip us. He came to show us. He came to get it down into this word so that we today will see it and do the same things. And that we will see people coming into church healed and saved and even raised from the dead. And I know that sounds a bit over the top, but that's what his word says. So then why shouldn't it happen today? Speak in tongues? Yes. Heal the sick? Yes. Raise the dead? Yes. Drink deadly poison? Hope not, but maybe you might. Who knows? Don't do it deliberately. But my concern for church today is that we are building a church of people that love to hear the stories of the guy at the front or the really charismatic guy on the right or on the left. Other way around for you. It's like we want to see and hear other people's stories and we see these great preachers on the TV and we're like, did you hear what he said? Did you see what he's doing? Oh, wow, he's so amazing. Jesus doesn't want you to get hit up on other people's stories. He wants you to go and make your own. He wants you to go out there. He wants you to go out and see people healed. He wants you to go and see people raised from the dead in his will. You know, it doesn't mean you're going to raise everyone out of every coffin because that would just be silly as well because why would we need heaven? And so what he's saying is go out, expect and go out and share my gospel. And when you share it, you will meet people that need it in different ways and you will be empowered to change them in the way that I decide. He wants you to make your own stories. And the question I ask you today is simply this. Why do we see so little movement in the Holy Spirit within the church today? Why do we see so much? And I think it could be that we have become crippled by intellect and reason. In verse 9, Jesus rebukes unbelief. And if you translate that well, you will find that it means lack of faith and hardened hearts. Could it be that the church has hardened its heart against the power and the Spirit of God and try and put caveats in Scripture so that we don't have to believe it's there, so then when we don't see it, we don't have to make excuses for it? Or is the answer that we should actually be going for it even more so that we see the things that Jesus promised that we would see? That when I look at myself, in fact, I did a little brainstorm. I was looking through my, my laptop just the other night. And I, there was a letter I wanted to find for this talk. And I couldn't find it where I wrote a letter to someone. And I'll tell you about that later. And I couldn't find it. But what I did find is a file full of testimonies from like 12 years ago, 14 years ago. Like testimonies about what God had done. Where I met with people. and had encounters at, at, at one particular time where we think there might have been angels. Where I'd seen all these things happening. And I looked back and I stepped back and said, that's amazing. But what happened to that guy? What happened to that guy? Where did I go? I think I became a pastor and I think it ruined me. Seriously. That actually God wants us to be people that get out. Even if you're a pastor, the office is not like your shrine for people to come and see you and say, oh, aren't you wonderful? It's not that. You've still got to get out. And that we need to remember who we're called to be and look at what we have become. And we need to go, God, is this who you want me to be? And the answer probably is not really. I love you as you are and I love who you are in me. But the work you're doing is different. There's so much more for you to do. And the reason we don't do it is because often we believe that when we go and do it, he isn't going to turn up. And that's just not true. It's just that we don't often go out and do it as much as he wants us to do it. We might have a little tickle here and there. But what he wants us to do is to live a life where we are constantly at his business. Constantly going and doing the things of Jesus. If you've got a modern Bible to hear today, you will find that just above verse 9, it says something along these lines. The earliest manuscripts don't all have this in there. And, and, and that's put there for me by people that have taken reason and intellect and put it above Scripture. Taken reason and intellect and tried to make a way out of taking this Scripture and believing it. We try to caveat Scripture. We try to make excuses so that we don't have to step out in faith and fail at times. But it's often when we step out in faith that God turns up. And we look at this scripture, we say, surely we're not all going to speak in tongues. Well, we may not all speak in tongues, but tongues is available to all. And we may not see people healed. Or when we lay hands on people, they won't be raised from the dead. So let's put some caveats in place so we don't have to do it. And God is saying, no, believe me. This is my word. I got it to you as it is. Do you think that God was asleep when they put this together? Or do you think it turned up on our doorstep as it is because he determined it to be that way? 
Oh, he, he forgot. He accidentally let them put this bit in. Surely we won't heal people or speak in tongues or, or raise people. That isn't going to happen. Handling snakes? You know, who wrote this bit? Who added it in there? And then you get to Acts 28. And you've got Paul sitting around a, a fire. And, and, and out comes a, a viper and bites him and hangs off him. And all the people are sitting there going, he's surely going to die in a minute. Let's sit and watch. And they're waiting for Paul to die. And he just gets his snake and he shakes it off in the fire. And he gets on with his life. And they're like, maybe he's God. Or maybe he's just following Jesus. Maybe he's doing the work of Jesus to the point that Jesus wasn't ready for him to die yet. So he empowered him so he would not die even when one of the deadliest snakes bites him. And he just shook it off. I've got work to do. And the people stand there shocked. Unbelief is the key ingredient to a Sunday club church. Do you know that? Unbelief is the key ingredient to a church if you just want it to be a Sunday club. Where you turn up every week, you take your chair, you have lots of friendships, everyone's getting on really nice, that's a lie. And, uh, and then you go and you had the coffees after, and then, you know, Sunday evening you're like, I really didn't like the way that went. Oh, I didn't like the way to do that. And every week we have to put up with this. And I'm like, every week we have to put up with you coming back with those stories. You are empowered to share the gospel. You are empowered to go and lay hands on people. For every moan about anything in church, I'm going to say, did you heal someone this week? Did you share the gospel this week? Well, I'm 2-1 up then. Listen. <laughs> this is what we need to understand. We were never meant to be warming seats. We were never meant to be critiquing. We were meant to be coming back into these places. When it says in Hebrews 10, 25, it says, don't, uh, don't give up meeting together. But it's talking about encouraging one another, bringing our stories together, coming back into this place. Not that it is the church. It's just a building where the church happened to meet. It's about coming back and encouraging each other and saying, yeah, I got beaten up this week for, for sharing Christ. And someone comes and puts their arm around and says, don't worry, mate, I got beaten up last year. It was but listen, this person comes by and says, yeah, but I did it this week and this person got healed. It's like, you know what? It's going to happen. You're going to get on people's nerves. But God's going to turn up. And we come back together as a church family, not a church building, to encourage each other in the things that God is doing and encourage each other that Jesus will heal today and that he will raise the dead today, that we just have to be faithful and go and do it. I heard a great story uh, from Robbie Dawkins recently. I was uh, reading his book. In fact, more like my wife was reading it to me whilst I was in bed. And I'm like, oh, go on, Lynn. And, uh, and as he was reading, she was reading it, I started to think, I can use that for a sermon. Good. Well done. Well done, my researcher. And, uh, and so I'm listening to this story. And I'm like, this is exactly how I feel sometimes. So Robbie Dawkins is sitting in the church. And he's a youth leader many years ago. And he's picking up the phone answering. And he's thinking, why on earth am I doing this? You know, I'm just like a receptionist. I am so fed up, God. I want to do your work. And so some woman rings him, and she says, um, yes, um, uh, Pastor Dawkins, I just want to, uh, I, I really need your help. She said, I'm a Catholic, and my family are Catholics, and my father is seriously, seriously ill. Uh, he's got a really bad heart. They won't operate him, on him. We forced them to operate on him, and he's just really, really ill. And she said, as Catholics, I didn't know where the local church was, so I rang you. And we thought you could rub some rosemary beads or something for me. You know, maybe he'll get better through that. And uh, Robbie Dawkins is like bashing his head at this point, thinking, what are these people thinking? You know, that's just madness. You're not going to rub anything together. That's not what we do. And he says, God, I need your help. You know, what is going on? I don't want to be a receptionist. And, I, and these people ring with these silly questions. And suddenly God said, tell her, I will give your father a new heart and a new lung. And he's like, what? <laughs> Where did that voice come from? We're losing it now. And he, he just shared it. He just said, my, God says that your father's going to have a new heart and a new lung. And the woman just put the phone down. And he thought, what am I going to do? I'm going to lose my job. You know, they're going to ring the church and they're going to ring the pastor. And he's going to say, you know, this guy is wrong and we get rid of him. And two hours later, she rings back crying her eyes out and said, how did you know? How did you know that my father had his lung?" Uh, apparently his father, her father had had half his lung removed. And uh, when they went in, they found that the lung was full. But not only was it full, they found that the valve they put in the heart the year before wasn't there anymore. He'd been given exactly what God had said. And there will be skeptics in here going, oh, I just can't believe that. It's like, that's fine. You can have the most boring Christianity you've ever heard of. <laughs> but I believe in a God that said he heals today. 
And I believe in a God that doesn't want us to be bored. I believe in a God that doesn't even promise that it will be an easy walk. I believe in a God that says it will be tough. You will be persecuted. You will get horrible times. But I will be with you. And my power will be above all other powers. And where there is healing to be had, it will be had. And where people need to be raised, they will be raised. I genuinely believe that. I have never seen anyone raised from the dead. And I genuinely believe that they will be. And that's probably because I'm silly or faithful. And the thing is, we need to get past this caveating scripture so we don't have to believe it. We need to take intellect and we need to replace it with faith. It's okay to be intelligent, but let me tell you, God is beyond your intellect. He's beyond your reason. And if you sit in your reason and in your intellect, you will never know what faith really looks like. You will be limited and you will be held. It's important that we don't get stuck in intellect and in reason. The second thing we need to know is it's time to believe the unbelievable. You know, someone came to me recently and they said, Mike, I find your stories like really incredible. And, and they said, I find them like unbelievable. And I just went, oh, thank you. And then two days later, I'm like, she doesn't believe they're true. And I'm sitting there thinking, scratching my head thinking, wow. And, and I had this a number of years ago. I think, why would I lie? You know, well, maybe. And so so I, I remember years ago that I was telling Rachel a story about how I'd gone into town. And uh, there was these guys that confronted me, five of them. And they were like in a little gang, homeless guys. And they were just really like aggressive. And uh, God turned it around so that I was laying hands on them by the end, end of it and praying in the name of Jesus. And... I was thinking as I was telling her, she must think I'm a liar, you know, and, and, and I've got to do something about this. So I said, why don't you come and have a look where it happened? So I took her down to this back street alley because all people that love their other half will take their wives to a back street alley and so, with some really dangerous people. It's a really good idea. Try it sometime. And um, so we get down to this alley and they're there again. And by the end of this alley encounter, Rachel's now laying hands on these guys and praying for them. And I'm thinking, not a liar right? I don't tell these stories for a laugh. So we're praying and this guy's like, oh, I'm a, you know, it's really quite heavy stuff. He's like, I'm, I'm a, I've been accused of rape and I'm going to court this week. Will you pray for me? I'm like, this is a bit heavy, dear. You can pray for that one. And, uh, <clears throat> but what I'm getting at is if we always keep our faith within reason and intellect, you haven't got faith. You haven't got it. It's not true. It's not real. That's not faith. Faith is much bigger than that. You know, what would happen? What would happen if we started to believe and desire the things of the Bible? What, if, what would happen if we started to dream for the things that Jesus promised? I can tell you what will happen. They will start to manifest. You know, I had a brother-in-law who's got quite an a, 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 a interesting mind. And uh, he, he's always thinking about weird stuff. He's like my best friend and he's awesome. And uh, he's always thinking like beyond faith, into faith, if you like. And his daughter said to me recently, he said, Uncle Mike, you, um, you need to tell, ask Dad to tell you about the story of what happened to him the other day. And I said, go on. And he looked at me like, no. And I said, no, 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 you need to tell me now. He goes, all right then. And um, what happened was, is that his daughters woke up in the middle of the night and their dad walks out, sleepwalking out of his bedroom, right? And he walks out and he starts doing this. And then they're like, what's he doing? And uh, dad, nothing. And he walks towards the stairs like this. And he gets to the top stair and he gets onto the sort of launch pad like that and he turns. And they're like, what's he doing? And suddenly from the top of the stairs, he goes <laughs> like this in his sleep. And his daughters are like, what do we do? And they ran to the other stairs. Like, Did he jump? And they looked down the stairs and their dad is down by this radiator squashed like this. And, and then one of them says, is he dead? <laughs> and suddenly he goes, and one leg pings out like this. And they're like, oh, he's alive. Let's go back to bed then. <laughs> Next day, they're like, dad, how are you feeling today? I've got a bit of a stiff neck, actually. And they said, yeah, you're right. And they told him the story. He's like, no. And apparently he was dreaming about being an astronaut. <laughs> <laughs> so, but this is the thing. I mean, it would, I, I, I think I would have disbelieved it if it wasn't that his daughters were telling him it. He had told me. I was like, you are just a weirdo. You know, I love you. Uh, but here's the thing. If you think about something enough and you desire things that much, you will be led to go and see them come in to life. You will. 
And if you dream about the things that Jesus is talking about, if you stop putting caveats and you stop listening to negative people like me that once a year get up and say, oh, well, you know, we've got to be a bit, you know, sensible about this. Oh, forget, whenever I say that, just say, Mike's having a bad day. What I really want you to do is to believe that Jesus was telling the truth when he sent his disciples out. To believe that these things can come in because they will manifest if we believe they are true. If we doubt, that nothing's going to happen. I mean, we will have some level of doubt. But if we really, really don't believe that these things are going to happen today, then they're just not. Or you're going to listen to some fancy preacher in a lovely animal t-shirt that he got from the charity shop and go, wow, hasn't he got nice stories? They're unbelievable. God doesn't want that for you. He wants you to be people that go out and see these things. Don't you want to see people healed? Do you want to see people raised from the dead? Do you want to see more people speak in tongues? Then you've got to believe. Because if you don't believe, you're not going to see it. You can't, you can't just rely on someone else to bring it forth. Listen to Hebrews 11.1. 1. It says, Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. Faith is confidence in what we hope for. And I hope you hope for the things that Jesus is talking about. And they are assurance about what we do not see. And here's the line. This is what the ancients were commended for. This is what the Abrahams of the world were commended for. You know, Abraham was accredited righteousness. He was, he was given it because of his faith, because he believed, not because he'd done anything special. He didn't do a rain dance. He, didn't do it. he just believed that when God said something, it was going to happen. When God said, move to here, he went there, not knowing how it's going to do. Go and sacrifice your son. He just believed God. And it was credited to him as righteousness. You got to look at Noah, righteous man apparently, and then he gets drunk and naked. How shameful. So how is he a righteous man? He was a righteous man, not because he behaved, but because he believed that when he was told by God there's a flood coming, he, got him, he went and built a boat as he was told to. He didn't go, oh, this is never going to happen, God. There hasn't been rain here for 100 years. How's this going to happen? He just believed. And he went and acted on the word of God. What we need to do is to take silly little lines like this out of scripture and just throw it away that says in the earliest manuscripts, they weren't there. Well, listen to this. Was God not there when it came to us? Secondly, what you do is the best way to interpret scripture is with scripture. And the things it talks about are the things we see after Jesus said they will happen. We see them throughout scripture, even to the point that a snake is thrown in the fire after biting a man. Of God. We went to, me and Lynn's went to uh, a, a, a hostel recently and they'd agreed to allow us to go and do an alpha course there in September with all the ladies in this hostel. And we went there and as we got there, uh, the, the person that was running it said, we've got some women that want to see you. You know, she was talking to me, obviously. And, uh, and so, uh, so we're there and uh, these women are coming through. There's one that I prayed for last time and had some, some response in what we prayed for. She's a Muslim lady, you know, been prayed for by a Christian and the things happened. It's funny that some gods are living and some aren't. And, and the interesting thing is this other woman comes in and sits down and says, yeah, we thought we'd come to meet you. And uh, she said, tell them how you are. And this woman, Evelyn, she says, I've been in chronic pain in my stomach for ages and it's horrible. I'm going to hospital tomorrow and it's just horrendous. And, and Lynn's, you know, I, I was thinking in my head, come on, lady, Paul Rank here, I'm the pastor. You know, I'll jump in and pray for this woman. But she's straight in there. You know what Lynn's is like? And she's like, let me lay hands on you. I believe that you can be healed today. And I'm like, okay, you have your fun, Lynn. So she gets in there and she puts her hands on this woman and this woman knows nothing about Christianity. And she's going, oh, it's all hot. And Lynn's goes, that usually happens actually. And she goes, well, it's so hot and she's like wow this is this is really weird so after that nothing you know that's the hotness has happened and, and when hotness happens obviously something's gone on and uh, and then the other woman comes in Muslim ladies so we pray for her lay hands on her she just burst into tears you know God has met with her and we're just like this is amazing so we packed these women off having had a good time and we went round for a tour when we got round to the back of the building this woman had already spread it around the building. And then this other woman goes, Oi, are you the, are you the healer lady? And uh, Linda, Linda's like, well, I do believe I have a God that heals. Yes, it's not me, it's him. And she does the whole you know, thing. And uh, so she's like, 
I, I feel like I can heal. And then Lynn goes into the whole, well, if you're not healing in Jesus, you're healing in something else, you need to be worried, right? And, uh, and effectively what happens then is the day after, we get calls from this woman, Evelyn, because she'd been given our number, and she's like, all the pain's gone. Every bit of pain is gone. There is nothing wrong with me anymore. <laughs> it was because I was praying behind Lynn's. Um, <clears throat> I recently said to my wife, I said, I've got this friend um, that I knew at school, and we didn't know each other particularly well, but I liked him. And, and it, I mentioned this at the members' meeting, and uh, I quite liked him because we shared the, bully, uh, the burden of bullying. You know, I got bullied, he got bullied, but all the time he was being bullied, we shared it, you know, so it was a little less on me. And so I liked him for that very much, but he's a lovely chap. And I said to her, do you know what, I just, because of what he went through and what I went through, I'd love to see him again. I'd just love to see him again. So I said that recently, and you know, last week, after 20 years, he turns up to church. Just turns up out of the blue, right? So he comes to church. He says, I want to come and meet with you. He comes to meet with me in the office this week. We sit down for 45 minutes. And everything he says about the issues that he's facing, he just shares all this stuff and all these questions he has about life and things like that. And every single one went back to Scripture. And by the end of it, he said, I don't think this is a coincidence that we're together. And I looked at him and said, no, I, don't, I think this might be a God incident. And by the end of that 45 minutes, he said, I want to give my life to Jesus. 20 years if we start to believe that Jesus will work and move, we will see things that even when we're speaking in a quiet place with our wife, God will bring them into focus. Do you believe? Do you want to see people healed? Do you want to share the gospel? Do you believe you can see salvation? Do you believe you can speak in tongues? Well, listen, the answer is yes, you can. And the only person in between you and that promise is you, is you. Finally, we need to take risks. Then the disciples went out and preached everywhere and the Lord worked with them and confirmed his word by, by the signs that accompanied it. There are three things in here that we need to take out. The first is, the disciples went out and preached. They were obedient to what God had, had said. You know, that doesn't mean once a year we go and share the gospel in our workplace. That means every day we pray for an opportunity to share the word in our, our workplaces, even if we look stupid. It says, the Lord worked with them. Can you imagine that? When you go out into the world, no matter how vulnerable you feel, God walks with you hand in hand. I can't share with that pack of people over there. I might get beaten up. Jesus is like, I want to come too. Take him with you. Believe that he's there. Go and do it. Share. Because you have one opportunity in this world. And if you do end up in a bad space and turn up on heaven's door, he's only going to pat you on the back and say, my good and faithful servant, come in here. It's warm, there's good food, and there's great people. That's what he's going to say. So don't be fearful. Know that Jesus comes hand in hand with you. And then it says this. His word was confirmed by the signs that accompanied them. Even this word here we've said today where there's caveats, it says that his word is confirmed by what actually happened. And that's what I want to say to you today. It's about being vulnerable. Gav told me this week that he was walking down the road and there's a woman with a toddler. And he just thought, I'll go and talk to her and say, have you heard about the toddlers group we have? She says, no, I'll come this week. It's about being vulnerable and seeing the response. I'll end with this and then we're going to pray for some people. All people, hopefully. I remember a number of years ago, I was feeling very vulnerable. And one of my family members were dying, and they were young, and they were tough, and I didn't want to share the gospel with them because I felt that they were still strong enough to beat me up. And, uh, and I just stood back. And I remember thinking, I know what I'll do. I'll go and pray outside his house. So I went outside his house, and I prayed, and I prayed, and I prayed. I don't know if he ever knew I was there. And then I wrote him a letter, and I got rebuked by, by ministers, you know, letters aren't the way. And I'm like, you haven't met this guy, I beat you up too. And, uh, and so I wrote this letter, and it was by no means the best letter in the world, but it was the gospel in a short page saying, this is what you need to do, and you will be saved. You will be saved. And I prayed, and I prayed, and I prayed, and I got rebuked and rebuked and rebuked. And you know what? This family would not let me anywhere near their son before he died. And then at the last minute, I get this call, and they say, Mike. We know that you have faith and we need you to come and pray with him now. He's going to die very shortly. So I drive down to the hospice in Crawley. I wasn't a pastor, so I just want to say to you, if you're not a pastor, you can do these things. And so I drive down and, uh, and I go into this room and I sit next to this person and I, I would be in family and I say to this person, I know you can hear 
I know you're not responding right now. I said, but there were two, two thieves were on the cross. I said, there was Jesus and there was two people either side. One mocked him and one received him. And Jesus said, today you will be in paradise. I said, no matter what you've done, if today you receive Jesus and you repent for those things, he will receive you when you die and you will go into heaven. And then he responded. I don't know what his response meant. It was some sort of response. I said to Rachel the other day, I'm sure he responded. She said he did because you told me when you came home. It's been a long time. And the interesting thing is, is that afterwards I was scarred for life because the woman, uh, the, the wife said, she said, aren't you going to do our father? And I looked at her thinking, what's that? You know, I didn't even know what the Lord's prayer was. I knew the first few lines, so I did it and then stopped. She goes, what about the rest of it? I was like, I don't know. I was scarred. I couldn't say the Lord's Prayer for 10 years after that because I was scared everyone knew I didn't know it well enough. And now I practice it every day, literally. And, and here's the thing. As I was leaving, guess who was coming in? The Catholic priest they couldn't get hold of anywhere to come to see him and give him his last rites. God wanted me there because God knew that I'd give him exactly what he needed to hear. I wasn't going to go in there to rub some bees. I wasn't going to go in there and say nice things. I was going in there to say, you got one chance, take it now, or you'll die forever. And I believe he took it. And what I want to say to you is this, is that if you want to see God move in power, you have to be vulnerable. You have to be willing to be rebuked. You have to be stupid enough to write stupid letters that aren't perfect, to be the most imperfect evangelism in the world, but know that you have the most perfect father in the world that will step in. That when we step out in risk, he will step in in power. Because it's faith. It's faith. And I want to ask you one question as the band come back. Is do you want to be a chair warmer in a church? Do you want to be our, our, our sort of, uh, I don't know, our connoisseurs of church? Or do you want to be people that go out and see people healed, see people raised, speak in tongues, see visions and pictures? Do you want to be that person or do you want to be someone that sees nothing and forever wonders why? If you today want to see the power of our Lord Jesus living in your life, I'm going to ask you as we worship to come forward and be prayed for. Because at Pentecost... It says that God poured out his spirit, spirit on all men and women and children. And it says that men and women and children will prophesy and have dreams. You know what? That's you. No matter who you are, what you do for a living, or how intelligent you perceive yourself as, God wants to put his power in you. And I can tell you that the church today has the power, but it's not in full measure just because they're not asking regularly to be filled. If you would like to be filled today and to see God move, then I'm going to ask you to come forward and pray. Let's stand ready to worship.